All right, class, go ahead and give yourself a big pat on the back because you have made it all the way to the last video of this unit. And we're going to be rounding out our topic on interest groups by talking about this concept of free speech and whether it applies to just individuals or groups and also how interest groups are regulated. That's really going to round out our last chapter. And in this video, we'll be exploring a few concepts. We're going to look at how the First Amendment connects to this idea of joining in groups. We're going to look at a really uh, important and landmark Supreme Court case called Citizens United. We're going to learn a little bit about that and what it said about the power of interest groups. And finally, we're going to look at some government restrictions on lobbying and what groups can do. Now, going back to the first few weeks of the class, we were exploring the concept of the First Amendment, and we explored how that is so connected to our civil liberties, things like our freedom of religion, freedom of the press. Well, it's also really important for interest groups as well, because there are some important protected civil liberties that we have that allow us to join with other people. First of all, we have the freedom of assembly, which means we can get together with other people. The government's not supposed to prevent us from doing that. We also have the right to free speech, which means that uh, we can express what we think. We can share our ideas, even if they're controversial or offensive. And we have the right to petition our government, which means that we can ask our government to make changes. Again, even ones that are controversial or some people would deem offensive. So I hope you can see how those rights, those freedoms are really connected to our ability to come together with other people to ask and advocate for change. Now we know that individuals, you and me and everybody else living in the United States have these First Amendment rights and there have been conflicts in the past over to what extent those sort of liberties extend to groups. Now do they just cover individuals or do they cover groups as well like corporations and unions and so forth? There have also been debates on how much and to what extent money and being able to spend money is connected to our freedom of speech. A lot of people have concerns about the amount of money in politics, and that really makes sense. I mean, we know that money can help individuals and organizations get uh, more face time with members of Congress. Uh, we know that it gives them some influence, and that might definitely disadvantage people without money as well. What would be the argument in favor of letting people spend money? And one of those arguments would be, let's imagine that you get your paycheck, you're working a job, and you want to spend your money advocating for a cause you really care about. Let's make it a cause maybe everybody in our class could get behind. Maybe you're going to be out there advocating for the needs of uh, orphans in society, people who've lost their parents, and maybe the government needs to do more to help them. So you might take all of your paycheck and donate that to getting the word out about this issue and, you know, sharing the information about a cause that you really believe in. I think all of us would agree that that would be totally fine. That's your decision to make. In fact, we can see how you spending the money in that way is related to your desire to make change. You're expressing yourself through using your finances in that way. So if we start from first principles, there's an argument that could be made that spending your money is an extension of your self-expression. And so then the question becomes, if that's fine at the smaller level, why would that not be fine at a bigger level? It's the same principle. And so you could really see how uh, there's a, a debate here between the impact on one side of some people having outsized power and the idea that people should be able to use their money to express themselves. Now, all of that came to a head in a really important Supreme Court case called Citizens United versus FEC. Now, the reason the Supreme Court heard this case was having to do with the 2008 presidential election. And at the time, in federal law, there were restrictions on how groups could spend their money. And specifically, it was going to prevent groups like corporations, labor unions, nonprofit organizations from spending any money to advocate for the election or defeat of any candidate. So already these groups had some real limitations on how they could spend their money politically. It also prevented these groups from airing certain types of information and communications before an election. So these groups were prohibited from airing any kind of information or doing any communications 30 days before a primary election and 60 days before the general election, which really limited their ability to speak out on behalf of candidates they liked or didn't like. So in 2008, there was a group called Citizens United. It was a conservative group, and they created this documentary-style movie about Hillary Clinton, casting her in a really negative light. 
Now, this was right before she was going to go into those primary elections uh, versus a very young and not a very well-known Illinois senator named Barack Obama. At the time, a lot of Americans thought Hillary Clinton was going to be a shoe-in for the Democratic nomination. And there were a lot of people who were surprised in 2008 when Barack Obama uh, did secure the Democratic nomination. So this conservative organization, Citizens United, they produced this documentary movie and they wanted to air it so that they could get their message out to the voters on why they should not vote for Hillary Clinton. But they were prevented from doing so under these federal laws. So they decided to sue the government. This case went to the U.S. Supreme Court, and it was actually decided uh, after uh, President Obama had already been in office. Um, but this was a really big uh, decision by the Supreme Court because it really changed what organizations were allowed to do with their money. Now, essentially what the Supreme Court said was that these laws violated the First Amendment. Some of the rationale that they used was, uh, you know, you look at the media corporations, right? Uh, there's no limitations on them reporting the news prior to an election. And in the same way, they're saying the Constitution doesn't really make a distinction between a media corporation and an interest group. Why is one able to report and the other one not? So essentially what this ruling did was it established that groups, including interest groups, corporations, labor unions, that these groups also have a constitutional right to free speech. And so they should be able to spend their money on political issues. The biggest change that this led to was uh, the development of something called a super PAC. Now, we looked at PACs in the last video. You know that a political action committee has limits on how much you can give to a campaign. Those laws are still in place. So a corporation can't just go out and give as much money as they want to any candidate. But they can spend as much as they want on campaign ads as long as they're not coordinating with the campaign. So what does that mean? That means if, uh, you know, I'm a big organization and I want to throw my weight behind uh, Joe Biden for president and I, I really want to see him elected as president, I cannot give his um, campaign money. I'm not supposed to be talking to his campaign about strategy. But I can go out there and I can run advertisements saying, here are all of the reasons why we think Joe Biden should get your vote. So as you can imagine, this gives organizations a lot of power to spend their money in politics and trying to convince Americans. You're going to see a lot of ads around campaign season and these efforts to try to convince people how to vote. And so on the political left and the political right, you have seen a number of people express concern about the amount of money that goes into politics. So you have uh, wealthy conservative individuals like the Koch brothers, uh, David Koch, who you see pictured here, uh, as, as well as his brother, Charles Koch, who died a few years ago. They spent uh, many millions of dollars supporting different campaigns of conservative candidates. And on the other hand, you have uh, more left-leaning uh, billionaires like George Soros, who have donated millions and millions of dollars to left-leaning candidates, including some right here in our own home city of Los Angeles. So uh, it does really open the door uh, to all kinds of uh, powerful interests, billionaires, very wealthy people donating a lot of money to try to convince voters to vote a certain way, and in some cases even giving money directly to the candidates. But I don't want you walking away with the idea that anything goes, that, you know, a billionaire can just go and give all the money to a, you know, member of Congress or some politician. Uh, that's really not the case. There are laws and restrictions in place that limit what interest groups are allowed to do. As an example, let's look at the case of Representative William Jefferson. He was a Democratic congressman from the state of Louisiana who got uh, really caught up in a major scandal. Now, Representative Jefferson oversaw the city of New Orleans. He represented that area in the U.S. Congress, and he was uh, convicted on multiple felony counts after accepting bribes. Now, in his case, I believe he was uh, communicating with some sort of an overseas organization uh, that was active in West Africa. That group was trying to get some infrastructure projects passed in that area, and they were essentially bribing Representative Jefferson for his help and support. Now, we know that he received at least half a million dollars uh, from this organization. Here you see a picture that the FBI took when they raided his home, and they found $90,000 in cash uh, in his freezer. 
So uh, he definitely um, violated the many regulations that are in place uh, that are meant to prevent this kind of bribery from taking place. So ultimately, Representative Jefferson uh, was convicted for multiple counts and ended up spending over five years in prison as a result. So suffice it to say, you can't just do whatever you want. There are restrictions on the use of money, especially if you're accepting money for your campaign or taking gifts. Uh, you know, there are some real strict laws about that. And so why don't we take a look at some of those? Now, when it comes to restrictions on lobbying, uh, one of the most important laws having to do with this is the Lobbying Disclosure Act, which was passed back in 1995. And that says if you're a lobbyist and you spend more than 20% of your time uh, lobbying, you have to register with the federal government so that the government knows who you are and, more importantly, the American people know who is contacting these members of Congress. Now, there's going to be some other limitations in place, too. Let's say you get elected to Congress. Uh, there's going to be pro prohibitions on your spouse becoming a lobbyist. And that really makes sense. I mean, as somebody's spouse, you get a lot of inside information. If you're, you know, in a relationship with somebody, you probably tell them about what's going on in your day. They're going to have access to privileged information, and they might be more likely to just be hanging out with other Congress members and their spouses and having some unfair advantage. So uh, spouses of Congress members cannot be registered as lobbyists. Most elected officials and federal employees are also prohibited from accepting any kind of gifts, especially when those uh, are high in value. So years ago, as I said, I worked for a Congress member, and they would actually have us go through ethics training, and it was drilled into us not to accept gifts. We're going out in the public. Um, you know, they would even say, like, if somebody's trying to give you a baseball hat or something like that, uh, you should probably just say no and not take it. And that's actually a pretty good idea. Because sometimes these gifts can be perceived as bribes. We're going to help you out with this gift, maybe give you a new car as a staff member or as a member of Congress. Uh, that can really be seen as giving some unfair advantage. And uh, so there are rules against that. We also see rules about so-called revolving doors. When you work in Washington, D.C., especially at such a high level, you make a lot of connections. And it seems unfair to be able to use those connections once you leave office. So there are some rules in place about uh, former members of Congress, former senators registering as lobbyists. And this also includes people that are on the president's cabinet who are overseeing some of the executive bureaucracy. So if you're in the House of Representatives and you lose your seat or you decide to retire, uh, you have to wait at least a year before you become a lobbyist. If you're a senator or you are part of the executive cabinet, you have to wait two years. They call that a cooling off period. After all, it's not really fair to just turn around and immediately start talking to your friends on behalf of some major corporation or some powerful interest group. However, there are still ways to kind of get around this. So it doesn't prevent somebody from taking other influential roles. So for example, the man that you see here on the slide is Scott Gottlieb. He used to be the head of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, uh, which has a lot to do with regulating medicines, approving different uh, therapeutics, and so forth. And, you know, after he was the head of that FDA organization, after stepping down within three months, he was offered a very lucrative seat on the board of directors for Pfizer, which, of course, is one of the big pharmaceutical companies. Now, who makes decisions regarding Pfizer? The FDA. It would, would it be helpful to have somebody on the board of directors who knows the ins and outs about, you know, how to get through the FDA and so forth and, you know, who to talk to? Yeah, it probably would be. Now, how can he do that? Well, remember, he's not registering as a lobbyist. Pfizer's going to have other people that are lobbying the FDA and the federal government. But you're still able to step in to these really powerful institutions and organizations in some ways. So many Americans obviously have concerns about issues like that. And here we are, folks. You have made it to the final slide. This week is almost over. Um, last but certainly not least is going to be public disclosure when it comes to donations. Okay, you're a big group or you're an individual. You want to donate money to a candidate you like or to a political party. Well, guess what? All of that information is publicly available. I can go through. The federal government's going to put out a database. I can see everybody who donated to that candidate. And so <clears throat> that's going to be an element of transparency. That's kind of a good thing. In fact, you can go to a, a website called OpenSecrets.org and you can see who was funding which political candidates. So that's a good thing for transparency. We know where the money's coming from. 
But as a result, it's also going to make lawmakers think twice before they accept money from a controversial donor. You know, if they think that maybe that's going to be more trouble than it's worth, maybe they will say no to that donation instead of taking it. Well, folks, I hope that you've learned about interest groups this week. Uh, there's obviously so many more topics that we could go into. I've really tried my best here in this video to give you a highlight of some of the main ideas and concepts that are covered in Chapter 10 of the OpenStax book. If you ever have questions, you want to talk to me, you know how to reach me, go ahead and send me an email or shoot me a message on Canvas. I look forward to continuing the discussion with you next time. So thank you for sticking around all the way to the very end and have a great week.